Today I want to talk about one of Michael Porter's most influential papers. It's his 1996 article called What is Strategy, published by the HBR. In this article, Porter revisits many of the concepts he developed in the 1980s. If you remember, like Porter, strategy um, comprises of two things. Firstly, understanding the industry environment in which the firm is operating. And that leads for Porter to his five forces framework. And then in addition, it's about the firm choosing a strategic position in that industry and then aligning the activities of the firm to give competitive advantage. So in contrast to the resource-based view, for Porter, the basic building block of strategy are the activities in the firm. Now in the What is Strategy article, Porter is focusing on the second of these two components of strategy, onto strategic positioning and the alignment of activities. Now since the publication of his 1980s and 1985 works, the concept of strategic positioning had been been coming under increasing criticism. It was seen that that view was too static in a very dynamic market that was emerging and therefore firms were being encouraged to rather than look at particular positions to increase the flexibility they had in the firm and also to seek out best practice and focus onto a few core competencies that they did well and then perhaps outsource other activities in the firm to gain efficiency. Now Porter responds to his arguments by saying that they are flawed. Indeed, he says these are dangerous half-truths that will lead to more and more companies going down a path of mutually destructive competition. The notion of hypercom in his view, is a self-inflicted wound. It's not inevitable, or indeed the outcome of a changing paradigm of how firms should look at strategy. In particular, he points to the failure to properly distinguish between what he calls operational effectiveness and strategy. In the 1980s and 1990s, they had developed a vast array of tools to improve the productivity of the firm. Things like benchmarking, re-engineering and total quality management. And the firms had seen significant improvements in their efficiency as a result of those developments. However, in Porter's view, these tools had led to a crowding out of what he would see as strategy. Over the time, as firms adopted these tools and focused more and more on operational effectiveness, they strayed further and further away from their chosen strategic positions and became increasingly alike. Porter argues that to gain superior performance, a firm needs to be able to create and preserve a difference from its competitors. For Porter, certainly at that time, by superior performance, he meant superior profitability. And he argues, perhaps obviously, that superior profitability comes from either the company's ability to generate more value at the same cost as its peers or to generate the same amount of value but at a lower cost. And Porter then makes the linkage between that question of value and cost as coming from the hundreds of activities that the firm undertakes to deliver the product or service that it offers. So overall advantage, therefore, must come from the choices it makes about the activities it does inside the firm. 
operational effectiveness, in Porter's view, is performing similar activities but performing them better than rivals. Some companies are able to get more out of the inputs that flow in the business and that greater operational effectiveness can be an important source of higher performance in terms of profitability. Indeed, in the 1980s, the Japanese auto manufacturers were far more operationally effective than their US counterparts and led to them posing a major challenge for those US incumbents. Effectively, they were, the Japanese auto manufacturers were further ahead on the productivity frontier in terms of the state of the art, in terms of the things they were doing, and therefore were able to offer both more value at a lower or equivalent cost to their US rivals. Now that productivity frontier is constantly advancing as firms discover uh, new best practice and innovate, such that if you do fall behind, then it does damage profitability. But to compete on just operational effectiveness means constantly staying ahead of your rivals. And in a mature industry, this gets harder and harder, particularly as new ideas and best practice rapidly diffuse to others and be imitated. In a competitive marketplace, that value generated by those improvements flows to customers and success, even survival of players and industries becomes a war of attrition with constantly falling prices and an inability to invest back into the business to Great advantage. So while necessary, organisational effectiveness is not sufficient to give the firm a sustainable competitive advantage. For Porter, in contrast with that operational effectiveness view, strategy is about performing different activities to rivals or performing similar activities in a different way. So deliberately choosing a different set of activities to deliver a unique mix of value. Here Porter makes a important shift in emphasis. Strategic position, he points out, is not defined in terms of customers. For example, Southwest Airlines serving price sensitive travellers. Instead, position is defined by a tailored set of activity choices that it makes. Porter then uses details from both Southwest Airlines and from IKEA to show how a set of tailored activity choices results in the services that are uniquely aligned with the needs of their customers. In the next section, Porter discusses the origin of strategic positions. And he argues that positions can come from three sources. Firstly, there are variety-based positions. And this is all about a firm focusing on to a particular or particular product or service area in which to specialise. Secondly, there are needs-based positions where the company has chosen a particular customer segment to focus on and satisfy all their needs. And then the third source that Porter talks about is access-based positions. And this is around taking particular routes to markets or places where customers can access the company's products or services. Now what Porter is doing here 
is he's revisiting and going deeper into the concepts of generic strategies he introduced in the 1980s, but better matching them to the demands of the environment into the 1990s. His subsequent work, which you see through his presentations and is hinted at in his, in his 2006 article with Mark Kramer, he moves on to develop this idea of types of positions further and end up with what he calls the value proposition. And so I'm not going to spend more time on these different sorts of positions as they do get superseded by his later work. What Porter does make clear in the 1996 paper is that any chosen position is going to need a tailored set of activities to make it different. So it's about the supply side in the organisation, the activities, and not the demand side, what the customer wants. Please note in that that what he's saying here is, is that if the same set of activities could deliver all positions, then firms can easily shift from one position to another. And so it's only operational effectiveness that will lead to differences in performance. Just to stress this, what he's saying is that selecting a meaningful position will give competitive advantage only when a tailored set of activities is needed to deliver that position. The key question about competitive advantage is whether a rival can imitate the position you have chosen. So what Porter is saying is that if a tailored set of activities is needed to deliver that position, then a competitor would have to copy all of those activities. Now, if the position is valuable, then competitors will try to do this, often by trying to straddle across from their existing position. So seeking to maintain their existing strategy while also moving into the new position at the same time. There's a link here to a long running debate about generic strategies and whether a firm can be both a cost leader and a differentiator at the same time. In the 96 article, Porter reinforces his original position on this, that straddling between two positions, you become stuck in the middle and lose out to others who are focused onto one position. You end up splitting resources, um, divide, dividing management attention and not learning in as much depth and so are therefore less effective in both your existing position and the new one you're trying to move to and ultimately get picked out off by competitors who are focusing. In the What is Strategy article, Porter adds to this by arguing that it is the presence of trade-offs in activity choices that make different positions incompatible and so prevent straddling. To put it simply, trade-offs mean doing more of one thing means doing less of something else. Hence, an attractive position that will give you competitive advantage needs to have a real choice in it. And in that, it means giving up on things, giving up on customers, giving up on distributors, or on markets that are potentially profitable. For a rival, therefore, to straddle from their existing positions to new positions means ignoring necessary trade-offs. So not only does that then make them sub-effective in the position they're trying to imitate, but it also diminishes their performance in their existing positions. 
trade-off choices can be copied, perhaps using a separate subsidiary within an organisation. But here Porter suggests that good strategic positioning offers another line of defence. Positions are not just around individual activity choices. It's about how those activities complement and relate to each other. By working complementary, they amplify the uniqueness of the position and the uniqueness of the trade-off choices that have been made. So imitation is not just about copying a key attribute or a key resource or a key success factor. You'd have to copy the whole system of activities and how they f those activities fit together. Now Porter describes three orders of fit of how that system of activities can work together. The first order of fit is around simple consistency. This is simply that the activity choices all line up with the choice of value proposition, the position that's chosen. So a consistent in terms of delivering and occupying that position. Porter's second order of fit, he calls reinforcing. And by this, he means that those activity choices are not just lined up with the positional choice that's made, but those choices about activities reinforce the effect of each other. So if you like, one plus one equals three. Separately, they deliver one level of value. By combined, you get more than the combined effect of each of them. And then Porter's third level of fit, he calls optimization. And this is about taking a system-wide view of all the activities and, if you like, tuning it to live a maximum fit to the position, dialing up some activities, but also potentially dialing down some activities so that the whole system works better. Porter argues that sustainable competitive advantage then comes at these higher orders of fit. Now, seeing strategy in terms of activity systems has implications about the way we think about strategy. So rather than trying to explain success around, based on individual strengths or single core competencies or critical resources, strategy is about thinking about the system and how strategic themes cut across functions and the whole organisation to bring alignment to the activity choices that you make. Now to help with this, Porter introduces the idea of activity system maps that depict both the strategic themes that have chosen to drive fit into the organisation and the activity choices that are made. As the organisation is joined up in this way and thinking systemically about the whole, as you can imagine, it's incredibly difficult for competitors to imitate a rival. They would have to first untangle that whole system, understand the bits and how it all works together, and then match that vast array of interlocking activities, while at the same time shifting from their existing system of activities. Now, even a new entrant without any legacy this would provide a formidable barrier for them. It would be easier to look to generate a new position. And hence why this system of activities leads, in Porter's mind, to competitive advantage being sustainable. Now, a major implication 
of taking this view of strategic positioning is in terms of the time horizon over which we have to think when dealing with strategy. It needs to be of up to a decade, maybe more. Not a single planning cycle. You need continuity to foster improvements in the fits of activities and gain complementarity across the whole system. So as a result of all this, Forta eventually arrives at a statement around what is strategy. And so he sums it up saying, strategy is about creating fit among a company's activities. The success of a strategy depends on doing many things well, not just a few, and integrating among them. If there is no fit among activities, there is no distinctive strategy and little sustainability of performance. So let's just sum up the key points across this long but important article. Firstly, operational effectiveness is not strategy. It's really important, but it does not lead to sustained performance. Strategy is about choosing to be different, doing different activities to rivals or the same activities, but doing them in a different way. And then sustained competitive advantage is achieved by firstly choosing a unique competitive position for the company. Where that position requires a tailored set of activities to be realised. Activity choices require clear trade-offs to be made. That might even mean turning your back on segments, markets that could be profitable. Sustainable competitive advantage then is derived from the fit across the whole system of activities, not just the parts. And so when you do all of that, it become incredibly difficult for competitors to imitate your position. Finally, Porter asks why more companies don't manage to do this and so fall back on just seeking operational effectiveness. He raises two possible causes. Firstly, managers are often reluctant to make a choice, perhaps fearing blame for a wrong choice, maybe a desire to remain flexible, or perhaps just to follow what everyone else in their industry is doing, you know, not, so not stand out um, and be challenged. He also talks about what he calls the growth trap. And by this he means that Firms are under constant pressure to grow from many stakeholders and to grow whatever the implications are. And so managers are often tempted to take small incremental steps away from their chosen position. So perhaps a few extra customers in this new segment, or perhaps a few product features or a new product line that would take them into slightly extended markets. Now in doing so, what is happening is that the position and the fit of activities is being slowly diluted. And so competitive advantage is being eroded. It makes it easier for rivals to imitate what the firm is doing. In avoiding these issues, Porter stresses the link between strategy and leadership. With so many forces working against making choices and trade-offs, leaders need to accept responsibility. They must define strategy, communicate the firm's unique position, make the trade-off choices required 
and forge fit amongst activities. But a leader must also provide continuity and discipline to resist the pressure to compromise, to relax those trade-offs, to get a bit more growth, or to emulate rivals who seem to approach things in a different way. So the leader must have a willingness to stop things and, most importantly, to be able to say no. So this is a really important article here. It's seminal to a particular view of how we think about strategy. The article itself contains an awful lot more richness than I'd be able to convey in this video. Lots of examples that are worth going and looking at. So please go have a look. Thank you for listening.